here. And uh, they say this, this is warm. That's what they told us. The sun's out, so it's warm. So we're going to... We're taking it in Jesus' name, but um, we, we're, we're so humbled to be able to spend the day with you, and uh, we love uh, Johnny, and we love Bobby, and your uh, pastors. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor James, for having us. We're just, uh, so many of them were a part of our uh, conference last month, and they didn't have to pray. There was no fasting or prayer involved. Do we need to go to Florida? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but you're all welcome. We love to have you down there. It's, it's great. And uh, Julie and I, we are, uh, the, we co-pastor Christ Fellowship, a church down in West Palm Beach. And we have, uh, more importantly, we met in seventh grade. We're seventh grade sweethearts. Met in church youth group. Hey, puppy love is real to a puppy. That's all I can say right there, baby. We dated off and on all the way through high school and college. It was definitely, whoever you're talking to is the answer. definitely more on. Definitely more off than on. I always thought it was more on. I don't know what happened there. But but I got the girl, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's off or on. I don't care. But um, when, when Bobby asked us to come and speak today and spend the day with you, we, a bunch of church planners, people that are passionate about Jesus and building his church, it was an easy yes for us because we love the local church. We believe with all of our heart that the church is the hope for the world because Jesus is the hope for the world and you are his hands and his feet. Wherever God has put you and positioned you uh, in the body of Christ, you are you are his fulfillment of what he wants to do on the earth. It tells me in Ephesians 1.23 in the message paraphrase, it says the church you see is not peripheral to the world. The world is actually peripheral to the church. And that word peripheral is what's happening off on the side, right? What you see in your peripheral vision, like I see my fingers moving over here, but I'm not looking at my fingers. And what that scripture tells me, he says the church is not peripheral. The world is peripheral. He goes on to say it's because the, because the church is Christ's body through which he speaks and acts and fills everything with his presence. That tells me that today Jesus' focus and attention is right here. Yeah. It's on his church. He yeah. sees the world. Right. He loves the world. He cares about the world. But he knows the only way he's going to reach the world is through his church. Because it's through his church that he wants to, to fill everything and move and he wants to speak and he wants to breathe. So what you are doing what you're giving yourself to and what you're sacrificing for and praying for, I want to tell you, it is not peripheral. It is critical to everything that God wants to accomplish in your city and in the world today. So uh, when we got invited up here to be a part of building that, because that's what Jesus is building, we're like, we're all in for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I grew up in church. I, uh, I found my... Uh, gifts and calling in the church. I met my wife in the church. Hey, so I yeah. love the church. Yeah, that wasn't my story though. I didn't grow up in the church. Um, I had great parents, but when I was 13 years old, I, I found myself living in the aftermath of a really messy divorce and, and two remarriages in a really short period of time. And, and my family was in a crisis and, um, and I wouldn't have considered myself a rebellious kid, but I was definitely looking for affirmation wherever I could find it. And I um, mean, I had brothers and sisters that were four and five years older than than I was going down a destructive path and I was following right behind them, going places where no middle schooler should ever go, doing things that no middle schooler should ever do until one day somebody invited me to a youth group. And I didn't even know what a youth group was, but I heard that there were really cute guys there. And so I decided to show up, right? And so when I walked through the doors, I had no idea why people had their hands in the air. I didn't know what it meant to be born again. But when I walked through the doors, I found what I did not even know I was looking for. I found a youth pastor who began to to call out the giftings and very hidden um, giftings that were that were within me. And he began to call out the gifts of worship. He would show up at my basketball games and 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 just call out the gift of teaching in me. And then I found a a, a youth leader named Carrie, and she would drive 30 minutes one way out of the way to make sure that that I showed up at every single youth event. A, a youth leader that understood that. A calling to ministry didn't mean receiving a paycheck. You know, she was called to, to pour into me, and that's what she did faithfully week in and week out. And I found one of those really cute guys there. So, um, but you know, I, I found people, what I really found were people that made living for Jesus.
Jesus so beautiful and so attractive that it took away my taste for the world. And then eventually, they led me to Jesus, and my life has never been the same. And you know, I love it. I love the church. This is why I love the church so much. We have welcome home signs um, as we pull into our church property at all of our locations, and, and that means something to me. Um, that means that, that this, when my family was in a crisis, that, that God sovereignly placed me in a spiritual family. And you know, what I felt when I walked into the doors of that church was, was something different than I had ever felt before. The difference was palpable. See, I didn't realize that, that I was experiencing the presence of God, the presence of his Holy Spirit being communicated through his people. See, this place was different. And what I felt in that moment was culture. I felt a culture of a people that were making God's house a home for people to find their home. And so, so many times you when know, we walk into a place, culture is what we feel many times before a word is even spoken, right? Culture is what we feel. And, and you know, over the last several years, there's, there's been lots of books written about culture. There's been lots of podcasts about culture because culture is king, right? We know that it's so important to build a healthy culture. And we knew that, um, that as, as, we became, as, as we became leaders in a church that wanted to also build a place where people could find a spiritual home, we realized that we needed to be obsessed with the culture that we build. That's right. And you say culture is king. Because yeah. It's because it is. Because yeah. uh, you can have an amazing mission, which we all do because our mission is given to us by Jesus. And you can have fantastic strategy to fulfill that mission. But if your culture is crappy, am I allowed to say that, I, Pastor James? Okay, crummy. Uh, if, if it's Nobody's going to want to be around you. <laughs> no one's going to want to stay at the church to fulfill the mission, come alongside you or stay in your ministry. So we have to be obsessed with culture. And so this morning in this opening session, we're going to get real practical about how you get obsessed with culture. Because here's what we know. Every church has one. You have a culture in your church. In your ministry, there's a culture. It's either by default or by design. You get to choose. If it's by default, it's what's left up to what's picked up. To the strongest personality in the room or in the church or in that committee or in that team or whatever. It just kind of whatever happens. Or it's by design. It's very carefully crafted and articulated. And there's, it's with purpose and intentionality and with accountability, right? And so we want to be a church and you want to be a church that is designing culture. Because as leaders, we're responsible for the culture. To define it and to design it. And a couple ways we see this break down is first you got to be the culture, right? As the leader, you've got to be the culture. If you want a generous culture, you've got to be a generous person. If you want a life-giving culture, then you've got to be life-giving. If you want a culture that is speaking the best over people and calling the best out in people, then that's who you need to be. And we've been around enough of you to know that's who you are. So we're not even going to focus on that today. We're going to focus on the second part, which is the first is you've got to be the culture. The second is you've got to build the culture. Yeah. And you've got to be obsessed with building the culture, defining it and designing it. And we used to think, uh, I used to think that, that, that it was built by our, you know, we got our core beliefs. We all kind of have the same core beliefs that, you know, foundational for churches and you got core values that as long as you articulate the core values and put them on the wall somewhere and every once in a while preach about them, then everybody's going to have this same culture. But as our church grew, we realized that was not the case, that that was not enough. And then we went multi-site as a church. And then, and it was that scripture, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. That started happening around our church. We're like, oh my gosh, we got to fix this. Yeah, I remember um, when a new team member came on our team one time. And, and when things would go wrong, I would hear their leaders say, you know what? You know, they just, that just wasn't really the heart of Christ Fellowship. They're doing things, but they're not really doing things the Christ Fellowship way. And I was like, what is the Christ Fellowship way? But it, there was something that they were tuning into. And then I would talk to someone that was new on our team. And, um, and, and we, in a coaching session, they would say, you know what? I've already been told that it takes about two years to really catch on around here. And we thought, two years? You know, dear Lord, we don't have two years. We've got a mission that's going and blowing. We need to catch you up and take you further, faster. And what we realized was that as leaders, it was our responsibility to keep a pulse on the culture of Christ Fellowship, to keep a pulse on the heartbeat, on the heart of our church and on the heart of our team. And we realized that, that if we were going to build a healthy, vibrant, life-giving culture, that we needed to become obsessed with one thing. 
And this is what we need to become obsessed with. We need to become obsessed with developing culture carriers. We need to become obsessed by, uh, 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 for investing, to invest into the people that we're going to carry the culture, carry the heartbeat into every area of the church, carry the heartbeat and the culture into the parking lot. So when people came on the parking lot, that they would know that they were welcomed home to carry the culture into children's ministry, into the finance team, whatever team we needed to develop um, culture carriers. And we knew that we need to be intentional about this because we know that strategy, a really good strategy, Strategy and intentionality will carry your vision through the organization. And so we knew that we needed to develop a strategy and a structure to develop these culture carriers. And so we want to just share a little bit of our three-part strategy, our structure of how we began to intentionally develop culture carriers on our team. And the first thing that we knew that we needed to do is that we needed to give a voice to that unspoken language of our church. What it really meant when people said the Christ Fellowship way. We needed to articulate that so we could give a language to it so that we could train our team on it. And so the first thing that we did when we, um, when we knew we had to do this was the, the first way that we did this by articulating that unspoken language was to define our leader values. We had to define our leader values. See, it wasn't enough just to have the same beliefs and the same vision, and even our core values that, that, were, that, that we made sure were um, executed in every area of our church. We knew that there was a standard that we held our leaders to that was even higher. And this didn't cause confusion about our core values. It was, like, it was almost like a, a, a double click down on our core values of how, to, how, our, how we expected our leaders to lead their teams and, and to articulate what it meant to, to do things with the, the same heart and the same heartbeat. You know, and this took a while to do. It took us a couple months to, to really begin to define those. And, and what we did first is we began to look around at our team and say, what are the things that we find ourselves celebrating the most often, right? We knew that we celebrated servant leadership and we celebrated environments where, where volunteers were flourishing and their gifts were flourishing. We celebrated excellence. And, and we, we, we decided to, to articulate what we celebrate and then, and then what we wanted to replicate. And these leader values that we came up with were really, um, they're descriptive. They describe the best things about our team, the things that, that we want to replicate, the things that we want to see the most often. But they're also prescriptive because some of these values had to be things that we didn't see as often as we wanted to, but these were things that we wanted to make sure that, um, that were being carried into every place in the church and every ministry. So when we talk about defining our leadership values, this is how we wanted our people to lead their people and how we wanted our people to lead themselves. So we're gonna go through a few of them just to give you an idea of what some of ours were. One of, one of the first ones, I, I think they have a, um, maybe a, a picture of our leadership values values up there, but our first um, leadership value is that, that we create environments that are full of it. Yeah. So around our, you know, our, our team, if someone came up to you and said, you are so full of it. That's actually a compliment. We'd be like, thank church. you You're so much, yeah, right? Yeah, See, this comes from John 10, 10, that Jesus came to give us life and give it to the full. That word full is an extraordinary, abundant, beyond normal life. When I walked through the doors of that church that day, I saw a picture. I saw a reflection of the John 10, 10 life that people were living out. And so for our team, we want to create environments where everything that we do is a reflection of the life that we believe that Jesus came to give, the people that are walking through our doors. And so when we talk about environments that, that are full of it, we talk about that being full of faith. We want environments that are full of faith, full of fun, full of family. See, in 2019, anyone that's walking through the doors of our church, they can get a great message online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They can get amazing worship. But what can they get here when they walk through our doors that they can't get any place else. They can get an atmosphere of faith. They can get a spiritual family and they can have a lot of fun while they're doing it. See, this is this we want to create an atmosphere that is full of faith, fun and family to be a reflection of an atmosphere that is full of his presence. So how we would teach our team and our key volunteers this lesson is we would say, okay, full of faith. Let's talk about that for a minute. You should be building spiritual expectancy wherever you go. 
whatever meeting you go into, if you're praying with somebody, if you're counseling somebody, uh, if somebody's hearing you pray or talk, it should be building a sense of expectation of what God is going to do and what God can do. I mean, they should be ready to take on the world after you get done praying with them at the altar. They'd be like, let's go. I'm ready, right? So we need, we, I tell, we tell our team, you need to be like Peter and John in Acts chapter 3 when they were going up to the temple to pray and they looked at that guy and they said, silver and gold we do not have, but guess what we got? We got Jesus. We've seen some things you haven't seen, buddy. We've been around some things you haven't been around. And so you might be low on your faith, but we got so much faith, we can actually give you some of our faith. And so we are so full of expectation. And so we tell our team, listen, when you head into the weekend or you head into Wednesday night or any, anything you're a part of, you are setting a temperature that is expectant of God to move. So full of faith. Yeah, ready to pray at any time. Then we, we want to make it full of fun. You know, C.S. Lewis says that, that joy is the serious business of heaven. Church should be a place that's enjoyed and not just endured, right? And, and joy is a spiritual discipline. Um, joy is also a fruit of the Spirit. It is a fruit of the Spirit of God living and breathing in your atmosphere at, at your church. Joy is the serious business of heaven. We want to create an atmosphere where, where joy can set the stage, where joy Joy is celebrated. And so we, when we, we, some of the ways we do this is that when people walk through the doors of the church, that we want them to know we want this to be the best hour and 15 minutes of their week. Um, we want this to be the place that encourages them, inspires them to live out the rest of their week. We also, um, we, when we do our big volunteer gatherings, right, when we cast vision, we do this three times a year. We gather all of our volunteers. It's called Infuse. And we make it a huge party where every generation from, you know, from elementary school all the way to seniors it's a place where we celebrate together and and there's bonfires and there's um, there's after parties and dance parties and silent discos with headphones it's, it gets crazy you know but I remember a couple years ago one of our girls um, I, I was watching her Instagram after infuse and, and she posted on her Instagram my church throws the best parties she was a senior in high school she was a senior in high school and I thought wow if this senior in high school thinks that her church throws the best parties when she goes off to college, that's going to define the kind of party that she wants to go oh, to, right? And so if the best party that she's ever been to is in the house of God, we know that we've made an impact that we want to make. It's also the way that, that um, we, we create an atmosphere around some things that can be disappointing. Around Easter time, just like your churches, you know, we have bigger crowds at Easter, right? So the parking lot's a little more full. The, there's sometimes queue lines lining up to wait to get in the doors. There's Sometimes we even have to go into overflow. And so for for us, we know that those disappointments can really turn into divine appointments if we create an atmosphere that is full of faith and fun. And so we're really passionate about making sure that, that our, our overflow you know, seating isn't just overflow seating, it's an overflow party, right? So when they walk in there, that they're, it's, a, it's an atmosphere where they people... They actually get, they get more in the overflow yeah, party than do. the people do in the sanctuary. There's like it's candy so bars on their seats, there's bottles of water under their seats, there's people that are having a... They get cookies afterward. I mean, it's like a party like yeah. I mean I only, I want to go over there I want to like skip because well, we know that the people that show up they're gonna sit there with the ones that didn't know that they had to come 30 minutes early right. so we want to make sure that we create an atmosphere where their disappointment can be a divine appointment yeah, we want kids running in we want this to be the best time of the week for the kids so it's creating that environment that is full of fun full of faith and the last one is full of family because we believe the church isn't a building you go into it's a family that you can belong to and we speak that over our people and it speaks to that deepest longing that we have that every person has they long to belong yep. down deep we want to find that place where it's our place we you know the place we can be at home and and people long for that and God created his church to be that for people and so we are constantly coaching our people and telling our leaders about how do we create an environment where everybody has their place wherever they are in their spiritual journey and they know that and they're accepted and they they can even belong before they believe <sighs> what a novel idea and we actually want even our kids that are growing up in our house with Christian families to know they can belong before they believe they, they it's okay if you're on your spiritual journey there's a place that you can belong because we're family and so this is just one of uh, the yeah. 10 we're not going to go through all 10 of them yeah. that's just one of our leadership values we have 10 of them but like Julie said they are descriptive and they are prescriptive they describe um, 
what we want to feel and experience, but they also prescribe so that a youth pastor or youth leader can take that back to his team and begin to, to build those out. A couple of the other ones we have is ministries they get to, not a got to. Yeah, which is it's good. what we get to do. It's not what we have to do. You don't have do. to do it. I tell our team, listen, this is not a got to. You don't got to do anything. You can go work at Home Depot if you want to. You don't have to work here. You're like... 0.001% of the population of the world called to fulfill the Great Commission that actually gets paid for it. So you don't got to do it. You get to do it. It's yeah, and we know that it starts at the inside out, you know, with our staff and our team. And one of our other values is um, what I'm a part of is bigger than the part I play. And this means that you are so important and your role is so vital, but we are a part of something big. We are part of, of building the bride of Christ. And so we want, when we say what I'm a part of is bigger than the part I play, means that we want this to be a place where you're gifting and your talents, they flourish, but they do not dominate. And so we won't have prima donna attitudes in our culture. That's right. And uh, another one that I love is uh, we're thermostats, not thermometers. A thermostat sets the temperature and works constantly to keep that at the right place. A thermometer just tells you the temperature. Well, that was cruddy. Well, that was a bad ministry thing. Well, that was a bad decision. No, hey, you're a thermostat, baby. You are changing it. You are you are working it the whole time. All right. So those are just a couple. We yeah, got those more. Are, those are just a couple. Yeah. But we knew that we had to give a language in order to develop culture carriers. We had to define our leader values to give language to to help them to carry the culture into their ministries. But the second one is the second part of the strategy is just as important. And you know, Todd, before I jump into this, um, this, this next part reminds me um, of when you and I first got married. And even though we dated off and on from seventh grade on, um, by the time we got married, even when we broke up, it was like, you know, it was really, really friendly all the way through high school. People, and college. Couldn't, people couldn't tell they when couldn't we were tell breaking we were up or broken on or off when we were together. As so we were really good friends. And, you know, Todd came to me when he was getting ready to go off to college. I'd already stayed faithful my freshman year. And he's like, Julie, I just think we need to release each other to God's will. I was like, okay, who's going to say, okay, I'm not, I don't want to release you to God's will. You know, I was, I wanted to be the spiritual one. So I was like, of course, that's what we'll do. And so we did. And, um, and so when we got back together, we, we just really got along really well. And we had actually never been in a fight. We had never had much conflict. So and we, when we, and when we finally got engaged, uh, she, we weren't even dating. Yeah. She didn't even know. I picked her up for dinner and I was like, this I went and bought a ring and yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to ask her. Yeah. Like when I say we I weren't roll, dating, it had been like hey. 18 months. We were not dating, not holding hands. So I'm like, no way. Are you kidding? So we finally got married. And yeah. No conflict so far. You yeah. know, we, we really breezed through the date and the engagement and all that. And um, we had a long distance engagement. So a couple days into our honeymoon, um, we are coming out of a parking garage. And I remember it happened. And it was, it was these seven words, you know, will you help me find the ticket? And these were words spoken by Todd in this guttural, almost demonic voice as we were waiting to get out of a parking garage. And I was putting lipstick on, you know, and I was just ready to be kissed anytime. time. I was minding my own business. And he's, he's like all frustrated. It wasn't There's, that bad. But there were like, like cars hey, honking hey. and, you know, and I was like, what we remember it a little bit differently, but what we both remember is the deafening silence that followed for the few hours afterwards. Which is not what you want to so, have happen on your honeymoon, I, guys. But I was, I was devastated because I was like, conflict had entered our marriage and, and I was so afraid of conflict because I, th I, I told you a little bit of my story earlier. I was afraid that conflict meant that the relationship was ending and there was a problem in the relationship. And, and so I was so conflict avoidant. And so I remember that early on in our marriage, I would do everything I could to stay away from conflict. And I thought that I was being a peacemaker, but I was really being a peace faker because I was not giving our relationship an opportunity to resolve the conflict. You know, so many times I, I fell into this myth that if I was in the right place at the right time doing all the right things, that I could avoid conflict. And so many times in the church, we can do the same thing. We may not say it, but we can do the same thing. We think that if we're in the right place in God's church with the right people, my brothers and sisters in the Lord serving together, doing all the right things, winning people to Jesus, that we can avoid conflict. But when exactly Exactly the opposite is true. And we know this in our minds, but it always catches us by surprise. And so we realized that if we were going to develop culture carriers and create a healthy, strong, vibrant, life-giving culture, that we needed to master 
the tensions. Master the tensions that come in to our ministry, our, our ministry life together. See, things in ministry aren't, aren't cut and dry. They're not simple, and we can't avoid the conflict. We, we, we know the scripture says we're in a spiritual battle, but we're also, you know, we're with family, right? And so we can't avoid conflict and run away from it. We have to master the tension that comes in. Um, we don't just, you know, work with people and staff. We work with our brothers and sisters. And so we have to, we have to, to master these tensions. And, and I used to have this, when we talked about this, I would talk about managing the tensions. But managing the tensions is kind of like, oh, let's just you know, sit back and, and manage through this. But when you manage, when you really actively manage tensions in your culture enough times, you actually do become a master of the tensions. And there's so many tensions that exist, and it's so important that on a team, and, in, and even, whatever, even if you're leading a volunteer team that you understand that that tension is normal and con we have to normalize conflict That's in right. our culture we used to think that conflict was the absence of unity yeah. mm -hmm. oh dear lord now the blessing of right. god is not going to fall <laughs> yeah. but conflict isn't the absence of unity right. it's an opportunity for unity it's an opportunity for you to lead and bring together. It's an opportunity for you to demonstrate the nature and the heart of Jesus and love selflessly. It's an opportunity for God to show up and bring his presence right in the middle of it. So if you're in the middle of some conflict right now in your area of ministry or at your church, just go, it's not the absence of unity. It's an opportunity for unity. And as a leader, I'm going to manage this tension well, because there's tensions. You know, we have, like Julie said, we have this welcome home. We're a family, but it's also a job right so there's this tension you're my brother you're my sister but yeah you got to get your job done buddy right so the definition of tension uh, is two balancing forces causing or tending to cause extension think about that for a minute it's two balancing forces causing or tending to cause extension and extension is growth so when you as a leader or as a team handle tensions well you're going to grow you're personally going to grow because you're going to learn how to master these tensions and handle these problems and bring unity. But your organization is going to grow and expand because you're going to come to a better understanding of, of the reality that you're in. So we've got this tension between at our church, between you know, family culture and this professional work environment. You probably have the same one. Is this a family, like a family to belong to, or is it a job to get done? Yes. It's, it's both, right? We love you. We care about your family. We care about what's going on in your life. And you got to do your job. We got, we got work to do here. And sometimes your brother is your boss. And sometimes your sister is your supervisor. So how we manage that tension, these are not two opposing ideas, right? Uh, I do care what's going on. And yes, I want to help you get your job done. But they are a tension that we constantly have to manage. Yeah, and I'm going to skip this next part just for time. But, you know, Todd, as leaders, part of what we try to do is to give tools, you know, to our team to know how to manage these tensions. Because one of the tensions is, as a leader, many times we're wearing different hats. You know, when I sit down with someone across the table um, and we're having our one-on-one -on -one meeting, I might be wearing my pastor hat, but then there's other times I need to wear my leader hat, you know. And then sometimes it's like, you know, I want to check in on their family and, and wear my sister in the Lord hat. Um, and there's just time, coaching hat. Hat. And there's so many hats, but it helps to be able to give um, our team a language to help normalize these conversations, um, to be able to minimize some of the conflict. And, and you know, um, for us, and I know it's important, like, uh, for me as a leader to tell the person I'm talking to, you know, right now, I'm just going to, I'm going to take off my, um, my leader hat right now because I just want to check in on you and your family, right? And there's other times I have to put on that leader hat and it helps them to know so they don't feel like they're in a schizophrenic <laughs> conversation when I'm jumping from one thing to the next in a one hour meeting. Um, but you know, as a, as a leader, I try to do that. But then we also coach our team that, that, um, that, that you, if you're being led, um, you can help your leader out. You can help them by, by helping them put on the hat that they need to be, that they need to put on. You're going to benefit when they're a good leader. You're going to benefit when they're a coach. So when you ask for feedback and put yourself in a position where, where you're, where you're asking for the feedback from the leader, from the coach, um, and not always depending on them just to be your brother and your sister and your spiritual friend, that that, that allows, um, that gives them a language to know how to manage through this tension. But another tension that we manage is also um, in, in our culture is we have to manage this tension between control and flexibility. You know, control and flexibility. The times that, the things that need to stay in alignment, we, when, when we use the word control, it's more about a 
alignment, the things that need to stay standardized, right, in our environment, and then the things that we can be flexible on. And, um, and too much flexibility in a culture will, um, the, the culture will, will run off track. You know, it's gonna, there's a drift from the culture and the mission, but too much control really stifles innovation and creativity. And so there's this constant conversation in our environment going on around this. You know, I wish that we could say, you know, people will say, well, well, in, you know, in student ministries, are we going to be, you know, 90% standardized at all of our different campuses and 10% and flexible and, and customized? Or, or where's the line? And, and I wish I could say there is a definite line. But the deal is, it's going to take conversations to master this tension because different seasons and different ministries call for, for different places that line has to go. You know, we know that, that, um, that, that, that there's strength in alignment. There's strength when we're all moving in the same direction. Um, but we also know that we want to be able to give you the opportunity to be flexible and try new things. And so, so for us, we know that different seasons require that line to, be, to move into a different place. When, when, um, when we're getting ready to do a change um, at our at, at, at church-wide, when we're launching a new program, like we a few months back or a few years back, we launched our, our journey, which is our grow track and membership class. And we knew that at that time, we were like, we had to be 99% controlled in that season because we knew that, that we needed to get all on the same page as we're turning as we're turning the wheel together. There's times when when people need some some of the people that you lead need you can't lead everyone the same. Some need more control and and um, and alignment and what's that? Definition. And definition in certain seasons as they're getting onboarded, you know, and then um, as they're as they're as they're coming new on the team. And then but there's some that have been here a while that you can give more flexibility to. But there's not a specific line. We have have to continue to have those conversations and this is a conversation we're constantly having in our environment because we have a, a core structure but we have 10 different campuses and so we know that, um, that that we need to be as aligned as much as we can but we also need to offer places and spaces for creativity. And so you've got to figure out how that applies to your uh, specific ministry uh, because there's going to be that tensions you have to manage and become masters of. But a couple of things that just to practically move on from this is first, talk about him. <laughs> when, we, when we didn't talk about him, that was when that was the biggest problem. When we actually started saying, hey, we understand there's a tension here between feeling micromanaged and, or I thought you wanted to empower us, Pastor Todd. I thought this was an empowering culture. I'm like, yes, but in this moment. And so when we began to talk about the tension, it actually brought a, a comfort level to the team to go, oh, we understand why it's a little more hands-on right now. And the second thing is we gave tools to help manage it. And uh, Julie, you want to talk about the uh, snicker bar uh, yeah. things? Well, yeah, we'll so, real fast. so we had to give our team some tools. So I don't know if you've ever seen, we, we know that when it comes to tension and conflict, for those of us working in the church who are, you know, most of us are conflict averse, um, that we need a little bit of help getting started. And so I knew that I needed a lot of help to um, to start to initiate, you know, um, just, just conflict resolving, courageous conversations. Conversations. And so I area that I was working on. So I wanted to make sure that we gave our team tools. And, um, and so when I, when I look back at some of my biggest regrets in ministry are the conversations I didn't have. Not the words that I said out of line, but the conversations I didn't have. And so we knew that our team needed some help. And so, um, and so have you ever seen those Snickers commercials where, um, where you've got the, the lineup of cheerleader, cheerleaders and there's the big burly guy right in the middle of the lineup and, 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 and then someone says, hey, you just don't seem like yourself today. And then they give him a Snickers bar and he eats it and he turns back into the cheerleader again. And the whole line is, is that some days you're just not yourself. And then the Snickers bar is gonna help you get back to yourself. Well, we realized that in our culture that sometimes people say things, you know, that, that they may just had a bad day or they might have been out of line in a meeting. And so we started something called the Snickers bar conversation. So you might walk into a meeting and someone might be waiting with you, waiting for you with a Snickers bar. And that usually means that there's going to be a yeah, conversation. This is sitting on the table this or is they sitting bring on the it table. in the office. You're like, yeah. okay. You it know, kind of prepares you. You're like, oh. I know that it's not your heart. But when you said this, it really came across this way to the rest of the team. Or I know this wasn't your intent, but how it impacted me and the rest of the team was this. And sometimes you might get a Snickers bar like this. Sometimes it's really just a little mini Snickers bar. So, you know, this is no big deal. We've had staff but meetings where everybody have, got know, a Snickers bar snack, on the table. We're like, we the gotta bite talk. Size, but, but we're gonna have a little talk. But sometimes I showed up in a meeting not that long ago and this was sitting on the table. So, 
This is the one she brings into my office. Yeah, so Honey. this is the big one. This is kind of a big deal, right? And so we need to talk about, but this is how we kind of give them a tool to initiate conversation. So everybody is, everybody's drawer, desk drawer is full of Snickers bar. Another thing is, is that, and it just helps to start the conversation and give a little humor. Another thing is, is um, if there's been tension in a team, right? And, um, and, you, and you just can't really break the ice. And, and we have these all around our, our campuses too, all around our team. We have these elephants. And sometimes you just have to bring the elephant in the room and so if you walk into a meeting and this is sitting on the table get ready because you're getting ready to have a conversation about what might be the elephant in the room but sometimes just having tools to break the ice just helps build a fun and you know again resolving conflict you don't really think about it being full of fun but it can be pretty fun sometimes and it brings life once you have these conversations in an organization once you as a leader normalize conflict and don't act like the um, ceilings falling in and yeah. the sky's gonna fall in and you know hey it's only drama if it's drama to you yeah. Yeah. as a leader it's only it's only a big deal if you make it a big deal if you don't make it a big deal if you go, hey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Guys, I've been noticing, but you go into it and you normalize it, everybody's at ease. But if you make it a big, oh, oh, oh then they're all nervous and the, and the tension increases. So these are tools to help you manage. Yeah, I think it's tension. important too to remember that culture isn't just what we create. <clears throat> Unfortunately, culture is <clears throat> also what we tolerate. What we tolerate. Culture can happen and subculture can happen if we tolerate the antithesis of our leader values and we ignore mastering the tensions, right? So because we have a value that, um, that we value unity, right, we won't tolerate unresolved conflict. Because we have a value that we speak life, we have a culture that will not tolerate gossip. Because we, we have a value that's full of faith and full of fun, we can't to and that, that values excellence, we can't tolerate environments that, that aren't prepared for volunteers when they come into the room. And so, so it's important that, that culture isn't just what we create. We have to watch out and not tolerate the things that will, that will, um, that will, that will sabotage our culture. That's great. Okay, the last thing, and we'll wrap up real quick, uh, is we create experiences that celebrate and articulate and and replicate the culture okay so there's a few experiences that we have on our teams on our calendar that actually help us reinforce the culture with that intentionality the first and probably the most important culture building tool in our church yeah. it, and when and if you ask some of the team that came uh, down to our um, conference the biggest question we get is how do you guys build this culture how how how, how do you build this and I'll tell you the number one way has been through our weekly staff meeting. Every week, every week, we have a team staff meeting where all of our campuses, they might drive an hour, some minutes, hour and a half away, all the team, everybody, pastors, worship leaders, kids ministry, janitors, secretaries, everybody's together. And for that hour and a half, we have a time of, of fellowship and worship together. We give good reports of what's going on on all the campuses, life change that's happening. It, man, it's like payday around our staff because that's like we get to hear, you know, the finance department gets to hear what their work at a computer with spreadsheets is doing in the life of people that are finding Jesus. I mean, it's amazing. And then we talk usually around the, the lesson has something to do around one of our leader values that we're trying to instill. We don't say this is leader value number eight. We just are teaching, but we're reinforcing what the culture, what's, what's important. And if you were to ask our team their favorite meeting of the week, they would say staff meeting. I mean, staff, it is not a boring staff meeting. It is life-giving. It is fun. It is the meeting that when we, we're going to miss it tomorrow because uh, we're traveling home from here. But we, and we ache when we miss staff meeting because we love being with our team. Yeah, and we'll usually call in and make sure that we can be a part of that. But, you know, um, the first staff meeting of the month, we, we do staff chapel and we invite volunteers and team leaders to come in um, that can be a part of that so that our team, that, that our, our unpaid staff, you know, the people that carry the vision, the culture carriers, they can come in too. But one of the things we do is we'll give out awards at those, um, at those staff meetings. And this is the Full of It Award. And when you get the Full of It Award, that means that your ministry or your area created an environment that was full of faith, full of fun, full of family, and it was worth celebrating. It's usually filled up with candy or... No some, sticker bars. No sticker bars <laughs> in this one. But candy or, or a pizza party or just something fun for your team. And it's a team award that we give. And the last time we gave this out, I actually had to go get this from them. The last time that we gave this out, 
was to our, um, our IT department because this goes into every single department. Our IT department, we had to switch over our church management system. Um, we moved to something called The Rock. And, um, and when we did, when we switched over, I mean, who knows that training on IT training for ministry staff can be torture. Well, our IT team made it School of Rock. And so they had this whole themed out School of Rock. It was a party. The training to, tra to, to get people up and, and running on the, um, on the new church management system it was a party. And we're like, hey, you deserve the Full of It Award because you made an app, what could have been you know, a drag, something super fun for our team and super life-giving. It made our, our team a lot more likely to actually use the church management system. So it was awesome. But, um, but these are awards that we give out. Another um, award that we give out uh, many times is, you know, a couple times a year, is we give out the, the award to the team that, that really undergirds and supports the rest of us. And many times this is given to our finance team right after a, a rough budget system or a, we're celebrating their audit. Or, or the facilities team who stayed late to make sure that our sisterhood event was, you know, that everything was put back together for the weekend. And this is a great award because everyone knows when the music starts playing, we call this our Wind Beneath the Wings Award. And, um, and Everybody we'll starts this. singing, you are the wind beneath my, and they come up. They and we come cheer. up and the whole team and a couple, somebody puts on <laughs> the wind beneath my wings. Someone gets to, the team leader gets to wear this. Everybody's singing the song and it is cheesy and it is corny, but it means the world to the team that gets it because they're usually they, the ones that are the unseen ones, they're never on a platform they're never, on a platform. They're never really yeah. applauded anywhere yeah. on the weekends and to celebrate them and to yeah. value them and yeah. it just builds the whole team yeah. up and that yeah. whole thing so that's that's one of the way we, we build we reinforce the culture another thing julie mentioned was infuse which is our leader gathering so all the volunteers that serve we call it we call them leaders because we might they have, have pictures influence. of that i think we're in and star wars uniforms yeah do you have yeah. that picture so we we have a party we we in the midst of the night, we are casting vision. We're telling them what they're getting some insider scoop, but it's always surrounded around a celebration of who they are and the values that they make. Yeah, and one of the things we do too with our new staff that come on board is that every couple of months, you know, anybody that's new to the staff, we actually, we, we don't tell them what we're going to do, but we say we're calling them in for a training and an equipping experience. And, and basically, um, myself and several of our key leaders will spend the entire day with them and we call it an extended cup of coffee and culture and so we spend the day really unpacking these leader values but also having a conversation with them so that they can go further faster in the culture of christ fellowship and and it's really a conversation with them but we know how important it is to spend that intentional time with our new team and, and one of the last ones that we just started just a, a few weeks ago is called thursdays at three our team takes off uh, Friday is the day off for the team uh, because we have church on Saturday and Sunday at our campuses. And so Thursdays at three, wherever you are in whatever team you're part of, wherever building you're in, you stop and huddle up. And that's a time of prayer where we pray for the weekend services. And it was all because I felt like uh, the, the faith part of full of faith was dropping going into the weekends and people were just showing up at church and I'm sure they had prayed, but there wasn't a sense of unified. Oh dear God, we need you to show up. And so Thursdays at three for about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you'll hear prayer teams all over the building and all of our different campuses praying and interceding and walking through the sanctuary and praying. And it just it re energized the team around. That's right, we have to carry the faith going into the weekend. So, those are, those are the three ways that we have built culture. And the beautiful thing about culture is you can build it when you don't have anything else to build. You may not be building a building right now, that's okay. You can build something more important the foundation, the culture of your church and be intentional about it as a leader. And we believe this is really what's happened to make our, our team so cohesive and so strong and ready for what God is calling us to do. So a couple questions as we close is this. Um, what is one leadership value that you have on your heart for your team that you need to articulate? Something that you can point to and go, yeah, I, I really want our team to get that. I wish, they, I wish they were more this. Or when I see that, that's really important. Why don't you just write the big idea down? It may, not, it may not be sticky yet, like what I'm a part of is bigger than the part I play. But what is the big idea that God's been putting on your heart that you need to go back over the next couple of weeks and begin to articulate this one leadership value that I'm going to begin to teach to my team so they can begin to teach it to their teams? Yeah. And the other um, couple other questions, is there a tension that maybe you've been avoiding on your team 
that, that, that can be leveraged to, for extension on your team? Is there a tension you've been avoiding that could catalyze growth and communication on your team? So what is that tension? And then lastly, is there a simple tool that you can use in this season to reinforce uh, the culture of your team? And um, some of the tools we talked about were the hats or the snicker bars or you know, just even having some times to, to celebrate the things that you value the most. So let us pray for you as we wrap up this session. God, thank you so much that we have the privilege of, as leaders and pastors, uh, to set a culture and a, and a climate where you can love people and draw people to yourself. And we know that as, a, as culture leaders and culture carriers, that's our, one of our number one jobs. And so I pray that you help everyone here as they are responsible for their areas of ministries, uh, their area, their, maybe their church that they're looking after. God, I pray that you give them wisdom and insight to know what they need to speak to, what they need to articulate, and how they need to develop uh, their team to be able to be the culture carriers that we're called to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.